And so, Lord, we thank you that you are with us. And, Father, we pray that you would help us uh, to know it. We pray that you would help us to preach. And, Father, I thank you for uh, the offerings that are made in this plate and the plate that's on the back by the stairs going down. This is kind of an announcement prayer, Jesus. But you listen to everything we have to say anyway. But, um, Father, thank you. And I pray that you would use all of this, use us as an offering for your purposes. But right now, Lord, I pray that you would help us um, to offer our hearts, that you would help us to offer our, our body, mind, soul, and strength as a living sacrifice uh, or, as, or a plowed field in which you are free to plant your seed that would grow into a kingdom, I pray that you'd help us to preach. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Uh, at the start of this morning's message, I just want to remind you that you could die in a fire um, started by global warming, trace back to global warming, and and you could die from a gunshot wound from an overzealous cop, or, or you could die in the riots that follow uh, such a thing. You could die from nuclear fallout precipitated by a president pushing a button just to guard his fragile ego, or you could, you could die by torture and execution at the hands of some left-wing government that didn't allow for the expression of your Christian faith, or you could just die of COVID. So think about that tonight as you try to go to sleep. You know, the harder you try to sleep, the harder it is to actually go to sleep because it feels like you're, you're drowning, just drowning in, in fear. And, and the very last thing that you can do in that moment is be still. And so you thrash around like a drowning person looking for anything solid to hang on to. You look for security. You look for reason in a sea of chaos. They say drowning is one of the worst ways to go. When you drown, you just can't catch your breath. <sighs> All your life, you know, you subconsciously assume that the breath is yours to catch, that it's within your control. After 84 years of faithfully serving the Lord, um, the most Christ-like man I've ever known my dad died of lung disease. He couldn't catch his breath. His lungs filled with fluid. Basically, he, he drowned. Sometimes I think of that when I'm trying to go to sleep. Psalm 46.10. Be still and know that I am God. Have you ever had this experience? You, you try to calm your heart and... You look to God, and, and then you really start to panic because you realize that it was him that led you to this point, to this place. The guy on TV said, follow Jesus and stuff will work out. You followed him, and now you're drowning. And he's just watching. And then he tells you, be silent. Be still. About 3,500 years ago, an entire nation of slaves none of whom had ever had swim lessons at the community pool. An entire nation of slaves heard just that. Be silent, be still. Exodus 14, Pharaoh had just released the Israelites from slavery. They've been encamped twice. They've camped twice on their journey to the promised land. But the scripture makes it really clear that at this point they were taking a rather erratic sort of route, not the normal route. Uh, to the, they were taking an erratic route that led to the banks of the, of the Red Sea. And it's very clear that this was no accident. They were following this pillar of cloud and, and fire. It, he, whatever it was, whatever it was. Remember, it had been 400 years before that Abraham had, had talked to God. 400 years slavery. And, and now this pillar of fire and smoke was leading them to a point where they would be completely hemmed in. To the north lay Egyptian fortifications. To the south, the desert. To the west, Pharaoh, who had changed his mind because God 
had hardened his heart. So, so Pharaoh was now bearing down on Israel with all the army of Egypt, 600 choice chariots, north, south, west, and east, directly in front of them, the sea. And for the Hebrews, the sea meant chaos and even hell, Sheol, Hades. If the United States decided to suddenly declare war on Rhode Island, Rhode Island would be in a situation similar to that of the Israelites in Exodus 14. Exodus 14, verse 10, it's evening, time to rest, and Israel has been commanded to camp next to the sea. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Egypt, just leave us alone, Moses, that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm. See the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall not see again until Olam, till eternity or forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be still. Only to be silent, ESV. Only to be still, RSV. You have only to, to be still. So this entire nation cries out to Moses, Did, did you and your God not have enough graves in Egypt? Is that the problem? We thought you were gonna save our lives, but you're like a lifeguard that leads people to the water and then just watches them drown. Slavery's better than this, better than this. And can you imagine how Moses felt? It's one thing to mess up your own life, but to drown an entire nation? He's gotta be wondering, what am I doing? Did, did I get something wrong? What is God doing? You know, God could have told Moses just what he was going to do, but no, it appears that he did not. Moses and the Israelites had received no explanation. They, they could see God. They could see the angel of God, the messenger of Yahweh, right there in front of them in the pillar of fire, and yet he just watched at arm's length as they prepared to drown. In the words of Soren Kierkegaard, they had no objective truth, like, you know, a policy manual or a map, just subjective encounter out on that sea of despair and chaos, just a divine trust me, a word, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord. He'll fight for you, and you have only to be still. Be still. Yeah, right. When they received that, that word, the breath of God that hovered over the face of the waters in Genesis 1 had not yet begun to blow upon the Red Sea. And they had not yet heard of Jesus, the one who slept on the sea, calmed the sea, walked on the sea. They had just recently learned the name Yahweh, but they had not learned the name Yeshua, that is Jesus. So Easter, yeah, we know this. Easter was on its way, but all they knew was a not-so-good Friday. And they had followed him to this. You ever been there? With Job on the ash heap? With Moses by the sea? With Mary and John at the foot of the tree on Mount Calvary? They had followed him. <laughs> You've followed him to this? I followed him to seminary, at least as best as I knew how, in order to be ordained as a, as a pastor. The Presbyterian Church, before I was finally ordained and as I was graduating, they required me to take the MMPI, the Minnesota Multifacet Personality Inventory. I took the test uh, late at night, I remember, before we went back for Christmas, and I was exhausted, I was tired, and I was in a foul mood. It had questions like this, do you like fire? Uh, do <laughs> these were really questions on the test. Do you believe there are people out to get you? Do you believe there's a devil that hates your soul? Yep, 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 I, I answered. 
I remember thinking, dang, if anyone took this test seriously, they'd think I was crazy. After Christmas break, I went to see the young psych grad in charge of the test who would be sending the results to the presbytery. She interviewed me for a few minutes, and I remember she'd stopped, and she said, Peter, are you an alcoholic? And I said, I, I, don't, I don't think so. She said, Peter, do you beat your wife? And I said, no. At backgammon, yeah, but no, I don't beat my wife. And then she said, Peter, there must be some way that you handle your anger. Do you like violent sports? Well, being an idiot and thinking about football and backpacking with my friends, I smiled, I leaned back, and I said, oh, yeah, in fact, the more cuts and bruises I get, the better I feel. And at that, she stopped. She leaned forward, and she said, Peter, listen closely. You have a serious personality disorder. I don't know exactly what it is, but trust me, you got it. And if you do not submit to extensive psychotherapy, your marriage will fall apart within a year, and your ministry will be an absolute disaster. When I expressed fear over this, she said, see, you're paranoid. So then I remember trying to calm myself and just be relaxed about the whole thing, and she said, see, you're passive aggressive. She said I could not trust myself or even the opinions of those close to me for my very perception of reality was fundamentally flawed. And she was sending this report to the presbytery. The governing body of my denomination, I, I had no place to look at that point, no place to look but up. So I remember I looked to God and I cried out, have you led me to seminary just to watch me drown? Did I spend all that money to go through all this work just to tell my father-in-law that I now have no way to support his, his daughter? What's the plan? It looks like you're trying to kill me. And I think I heard his answer. Yep. That's right, Peter. I'm trying to kill that prideful, old, independent, lonely you. So fear not. Stand firm. See the salvation of your Lord I will fight for you, and you have only to be still. A friend paid for me to be retested by a more reputable psychiatrist, and he declared the first test to be a misdiagnosis. The whole thing is funny now, but I wasn't laughing then. The psychiatrist the, the, said that the first test was a misdiagnosis, but I'm pretty sure that the experience was a perfect prescription because I tend to believe that I am my own savior. And you see, that makes me neurotic as hell and a pretty poor pastor, and a pretty poor husband, my own Savior. And God showed me that only He is sufficient for that role. Well, when you get through something like that, you tend to think to yourself, okay, great. I learned the lesson, God. Now you can bless me with stuff. But maybe that lesson is the only lesson, and that wasn't simply the end. It was also the beginning. It was my baptism if you will. Twelve years ago, I felt pinned against the banks of the Red Sea once again. But now I wasn't alone. There were people following me. I mean, it's one thing to mess up your own life, but to mess up everybody's life? People were following me, some of you even, and I was terrified. For almost 20 years, I've been a pastor and watched a church grow from a small group to a few thousand, published books, built a, a, a building, all by testifying uh, to God is salvation. In a word, Yahshua, which I've told you comes from Yahweh and Yasha, Yahashua or Joshua. In English, we pronounce the name Jesus. Well, there are some who say God is salvation, but you see, I think they mean by that God is salvation and, well, just the opposite, not salvation. Or they mean by that God is, uh, by God is salvation, they, they really mean God is salvation if you, if you want him to be. Or, in other words, we are salvation. So some people say God is salvation or God saves. Those can be either one of those. They say God is salvation, but we have free will. And by that they mean that God is like a lifeguard that swims up to drowning people, flaying, flaying about in, in panic and desperation, and says, do you want to be saved? 
And if they do not respond in the appropriate way, he just watches them drown because he respects their free will. If you're into theology, those folks are usually called Arminian. I, I was a lifeguard in high school, but if I'd been a lifeguard like that, I'd, I'd, well, I'd be in prison. Your Honor, I had to let Mikey drown because he never truly wanted to be saved. Other people say God is salvation or God saves. And the very thing that he saves us from is our bad will, our sin. So we're drowning in bad will and God says, God saves us, he, God saves us from our bad will by giving us his good free will. Another word for that is righteousness. That's, that's not our choice, but his choice due to no merit of our own. I think that is right, but then they go on to say, and God proves this fact by only saving some and damning all the rest. That would mean that God is like a lifeguard that randomly picks which kids he will save in the morning when they come to the pool, and then at the end of the day, he expects the ones that he saved to be eternally grateful because he decided to save them, but not save the other children that he watched drown in the pool or tortured forever and ever and ever without end. If you're into theology, you know, those folks are usually called Calvinists. But if I'd been a lifeguard like that, I'd definitely be in prison. Your Honor, I, I couldn't save Mikey because, well, Susie needs to know that I saved her due to no merit of our own and, and be grateful. Mikey needs to be grateful. Well, 12 years ago, you, you know, I thought God had called me to testify to God is salvation. That's just, it's who he is. And also that according to Scripture, he saves all. All drown and all are saved due to no merit of their own. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and that same all are justified by his grace as a gift. That's Romans 3, 23. I felt called to testify, and never before in my life had I felt so uh, clear, clearly called, uh, uh, so obviously following the pillar of fire and, and smoke, and, and yet I found myself at the edge of the sea. They said, confess that God can't save some and that God doesn't want to save some or you won't be saved, Peter. You'll lose everything you work for. I cried out to God, I remember, have you led me all the way to this point just to watch me drown? Just so I can tell my father-in-law that I have no way to support his daughter and now his grandchildren too? As you know, that was the beginning of the sanctuary, which is us. For 12 years now, God has done all sorts of little things, pretty big things to guide the way. I could tell all kinds of stories, but at times it's really been like a pillar of fire leading the way. And I think we've followed, but I still find myself hemmed in at the edge of chaos. And it often feels like God is just watching me and sometimes watching us drown. I feel hemmed in by conservative Christians, both Arminian and Calvinists, who hate the idea that God in Christ Jesus saves all of us from our sins. Hemmed in by liberals who hate the idea that we all actually need saving, not just from bad social policy, but our own wretched sins. Sometimes I wonder if we're gonna make it, and then COVID happens. Shutdowns happen, racial injustice, riots, fires, political idolatry in every direction. It all happens, and I wonder, should we just quit? You know, I preach, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, but inside I'm crying, what are you doing, God? Are you just watching us drown? Well, that's my story. And for, for many of you, it's our story, but we all have stories. Why does God lead us to the edge of chaos and just watch us drown? If God is salvation, why does he seem to will sometimes not save. What kind of lifeguard just watches people drown? Well, maybe actually a, a pretty good one. As I, I mentioned, I was a lifeguard. Alan was too, senior year of high school. <laughs> and in lifeguard training, they taught us that people in a panic are incredibly difficult to save because 
They are so desperately trying to save themselves. Several years ago, I took my kids, my, my disciples, those are my disciples, I took them on a banana boat ride, pulled by a speedboat, you know, in the Sea of Cortez. Becky, second from the left, about sixth grade at the time, was absolutely terrified of, of sharks. When the banana, banana boat flipped over, like I figured that it would, it's kind of designed to do, well, well, Becky literally tried to stand on my head. And, and I thought that we were both going to drown. So I just, I remember trying to get angry at, at Becky. I finally just started yelling at her, stop it, stop it, stop it. Fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of your dad. Your dad will swim for and you have only to be still. Now, Becky was probably only about 70 pounds at that time, wearing a life jacket. But in lifeguard training, they taught us that a large and panicked person can easily drown both themselves and the person that's trying to, to save them. So to save, to save a large, panicked person, desperately trying to save themselves, it's imperative that you do this. You swim out to them, and then you stop just at arm's length, and you watch them drown for a while. You let them wear themselves out until they have no choice but, but to trust. You let them come to the end of their own strength so that you can save them with your own strength. Now, God has more than enough strength to overpower any one of us at any time that we'd like, but maybe he's saving us from far more than drowning in water. Maybe he's saving us from drowning in shame and fear, and anxiety, and, and sin, which is all reliance upon your own strength, which can all be traced back to a lie told by a snake to convince each one of us that we must be our own salvation. Well, Moses cries out to all of Israel, drowning in fear at the edge of chaos, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation. Yahshua in Hebrew, it's a passive participle of Yasha. See the Yeshua of Yahweh, the Lord. The Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. You have only to be still. Now, I believe that that is God's word spoken to Israel through Moses the prophet. But then Exodus 14, 15, the Lord says to Moses, why do you cry to me, Moses? You know, I preach this stuff and then I cry to God, why are you doing this? What are you doing? Can, can I quit? Should we stop? Because God, I don't understand and I'm scared. Well, God says to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people to go forward. So, so resting in God, being silent, being still, doesn't mean that you simply do nothing. I think it means you do everything, but you do it like in a new in a new way. You, you do it with faith, faith that God is salvation. Yeshua, like Yahashua, which becomes a name, you know, pronounced Yeshua in Aramaic or in English, Jesus. And he's not a plan that you can comprehend. He's a person that you must trust. Verse 13, see the Yeshua of Yahweh, verse 15, and tell the people to go forward. Lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen, then the angel of God, the angel of God, the messenger of Yahweh is this fascinating Old Testament character. He's like fully God and fully man. In the Old Testament, they don't know his name but you do the angel of God who was going before the host of Israel moved and went behind them so he's he's and it says he never goes he never leaves from being in front of them leading them so he's behind him before them and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them coming between the hosts of Egypt and the hosts of Israel and there was the cloud and the darkness and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord drove back the sea by a strong east ruach a wind a breath a spirit all night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided and the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them in the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, his horsemen. Verse 30. 
Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel, Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Yahweh is my strength and my song, and he has become my Yeshua, my salvation. Yeshua, Yahashua, Yeshua, it all means Jesus. They sing, Yahweh has become my Yeshua. Can, can you imagine how they felt that morning as the sun came up? After 400 years of being slaves in Egypt, can you imagine how they laughed and how they sang? You know, they could have sang and laughed just as loud on the western bank before they crossed the sea as they did on the eastern bank after they crossed the sea if they had had faith in Yeshua, the Lord is salvation. And now you may say, okay, pastor, thank you. Nice story. But uh, what about the Egyptians? that drown in the sea. Oh yeah, and what about the Israelites? Because they all die in the desert, except for Joshua and Caleb. Yep, some even sink alive into Sheol. That's hell in the King James, number 1632. The earth swallowed them. It's the exact same phrase used for the Egyptians in Exodus 15, 12. The earth swallowed them, so yeah. You may wonder, what about the Egyptians? What about the Israelites that, that all die in the desert except two. What about you, Peter? One day you're going to die. Well, what about the church? One day it will disband. What about your dad? You yourself said that he could not catch his breath and drown from all the fluid in, in his lungs. Yeah. That's all true. But for some reason we think that's the end of the line for my dad for us, for those Israelites and the Egyptians. Check out Isaiah 19, 21 through 25. And the Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians. And the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day and worship him with sacrifice and offering. And they will make vows to the Lord and perform them. In that day, Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria, uh, um, with Egypt and uh, Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed be the Egyptian, blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. Now, some would argue, okay, yeah, but that's some other Egypt, Peter. But the prophets make it clear that one day every knee will bow and every tongue give praise. What about the Israelites? Did you know that already by Exodus 14 in Exodus, God has reminded Israel of his unconditional promise to Abraham to bring them into the promised land five times. And yet all of them, including Moses, die in the wilderness. All of them except Yahashua, Joshua, and Caleb, which means dog, except for Yeshua, Jesus, and his dog. So, so anyway, they all die in the wilderness, so did God keep his promise? We'll check out Ezekiel 37, 11. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. The whole, if you take scripture seriously, what does that mean? Well, it means one of those, the names of one of those people was like, was like Judas. Or maybe Carl, Marx. These bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. They're dead. They're dead and they think they're in Hades. Because they are. Our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, we are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy, says the Lord, and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from my, your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it, declares the Lord. 
You know, Jesus is the son of man. He's the angel of Yahweh. He's the promised seed of Abraham. He's the word that God speaks into chaos, creating all things. He's the judgment of God. And at the end of the sixth day, he hangs on a tree in a garden on a mountain from which he descends into the depths of the earth, the belly of Sheol, and leads a host of captives free. God is leading us all to the edge of chaos. God is leading us all to the foot of the tree. He's leading us to a place where any illusion that we could create ourselves, save ourselves, redeem ourselves is utterly shattered upon the reality of the one who is our creator, our savior, and our redeemer. It's the place where we each, where we lose our life and find it. It's the place where we die with him and rise with him. He's saving us, you see, from far more than Egyptians. He's saving us from far more than drowning in a swimming pool or Democrats or Republicans or Antifa or fascists or fires or COVID. Which may lead you to this question. Okay, that's great, but then why lead us to the banks of the Red Sea? Why these brushes with death along the way? When 1 Corinthians 10 to right into get this, Gentile Christians, Paul writes this, our fathers, he says our fathers, all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea, baptized. Ephesians 4 verse 5, he tells us that there is one baptism. Romans 6, Colossians 2, he tells us that we were buried with Christ in baptism. So check this out, Jesus didn't die so you wouldn't have to. He came to help you die so that you could rise from the dead with him. The Israelites wanted God to save their bodies from death, right? But Paul cries out, who will save me from this body of death? That's a twist, right? They all wanted them to, God to save the, their bodies, and Paul cries out, please save me from this body of death. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, he writes, in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. That's our body, Christ's body. In seminary, I cried out, why did you lead me to seminary? Just to watch me drown? Are you trying to kill me? And I think God answered, of course, Peter. Of course I'm trying to kill that lonely, old, prideful, sinful of you. What part of pick up your cross and follow did you not understand? I'm saving you from your lonely old self and making you my body and bride. I'm trying to kill that prideful, self-centered, lonely old you that I might raise you to unspeakable joy in the dance of love that is my very life. The journey to the edge of the Red Sea, the times when you feel as if you've utterly lost control, you see, it's all dress rehearsal. It's dress rehearsal for the day you finally lose the illusion that you think is yourself and then find yourself in me. Every trial's a dress rehearsal for death and resurrection. Paul writes something really fascinating in 1 Timothy 4. Check this out. Verse 9. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. You know what I think that means? I think he's, it means he's the Savior of all people. All the, all the time. So if you're in darkness and you see the light, well, Jesus is the light, the light that enlightens every man. If you're lost and you find the way, well, that's Jesus. He's the way that finds you, whether you know it or not. If you're deceived, but then you see the truth, that's Jesus. Jesus is the truth. Anytime you experience life, you experience the life who is Jesus. He's just saved you from darkness, death, lies, and the land of the law. Psalm 145, verse 14. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed, bowed down. All. The Lord, of course, does all of this with his word, which he speaks into chaos, chaos, creating and sustaining all things, including every molecule in your body. What if you suddenly realized 
that every molecule in your body, what if you suddenly realized that every breath in, in your lungs only existed because someone constantly willed it into existence? What would you do in that person's presence? Would you rest? Would you go for a walk with them in the cool of the day in a garden? Or would you freak out, run, and hide in fear? He is the savior of all people, especially those who believe. For you see, we especially need to be saved from not believing. God is good. And God is salvation. So you see, there's a gift that God imparts at the banks of the Red Sea and at the tree on the mount, on Mount Calvary. God saves us constantly. But it's at the Red Sea and it's at this tree that we see our salvation. And we begin to trust. We begin to trust God is salvation in a word, Jesus. Trust, and this is, these are all words are all pretty much the same in Greek, but trust is faith. People ask, do I need faith to be saved? Well, not only do you need faith to be saved, salvation is faith. If you believe that you are a self-made man, your own salvation, and you get what you deserve, you are certainly not going to enjoy the presence of your creator, the unmitigated presence of your tr creator, the, the touch of your savior, and the divine judgment of grace. You'll run and hide in outer darkness, fig leaves in shame, or perhaps even burst into fire right there in his presence, burst into flame. So salvation is faith. Faith is what the Adam lacked in the garden before the fall. When God said it's not good that the Adam is alone, the Adam lacked faith in God who is love. Love is losing yourself and finding yourself in another. Love is life. You cannot live unless you're willing to die to yourself. That is your ego. Well, as I was saying, the Israelites could have laughed and sang just as loud on the eastern bank of the Red Sea as they did on the western bank if they had had faith in Yeshua, the Lord is salvation. They could have laughed, just as I could have laughed when the psych student read the results of my MMPI and prepared to send them to the presbytery. They could have laughed just as I could have laughed as the, well, for the last 12 years, rather than worrying and fretting, and just as Paul and Silas laughed and sang chained in the stocks in the Philippian jail, they, they could have laughed just as Psalm 2, 4, he who sits in the heavens laughs. You know, laughter is a really fascinating thing when you think about it. When we really laugh, deep, wholesome belly laughs, what is it that we're laughing at? Isn't it the human ego? Human pride, human ego, especially your own ego, which is the utterly ridiculous idea that we are each our own creator. I mean, how obviously is that not true? But it's the absurd idea that we're each our own creator, our own savior, and our own redeemer. The summer that I worked as a lifeguard, I only saved one person. But I saved him quite a bit. His, his name was Michael. Michael was five years old without an ounce of fat on his body. And Michael absolutely, absolutely loved the water, but he could not swim. Routinely, he'd be sitting there with his sister Susie out on the grass, and he'd get this, I'd watch him, he'd get this wild look in his eyes. He'd just take off, running for the pool, jump into the pool, shallow end or the deep end, it didn't matter. He'd drown in either end. He was that short. And so routinely, I'd save him. But what always amazed me was that as I swam to him or walked to him in the shallow end, I mean, even as he was thrashing about gasping for air, and I got close to him, his eyes would be open in wonder and delight, looking for me, and Michael would just always be laughing. I'd pull him out, and I'd give him these little talks. I'd say, Michael, listen! Don't drown! 
Michael, you could die. Do you understand? You could die. I remember him looking up at me with his big eyes, and he said, do you mean that, does that mean I couldn't go swimming anymore? <laughs> I'd try to get mad at Michael, and I just couldn't. Because he'd look at me with those eyes as if to say, but Peter, why should I be afraid? Whenever I start to drown, you jump in and swim for me, and I have only to be still. He would laugh while drowning because he knew I was his savior. <laughs> Michael was my, my favorite. He was my champion because he knew that I was his champion. He laughed while drowning, and that laughter was faith, and faith is more precious than gold. Of course, faith in me is misplaced trust, but what I'm saying is that faith in Jesus is never misplaced trust. He'll take you to the edge many times on your trip through this wilderness of the world just to show you that he is salvation, but one day you really won't be able to catch your breath. That's the day that your old body will die, and all at once you will come to a startling realization. All this time that you've been trying to catch your breath, the breath of God has been catching you. Oh, and then you will laugh. You will laugh and laugh and laugh like you've never laughed before. If you try to hold your breath, your life, if you try to hold your breath, uh, the breath in fear, well, then you might get trapped in outer darkness for a time. I mean, I do believe that there is this place called Hades but if you surrender your breath, saying, into your hands I commit my spirit, my breath, my ruach, I suspect that your next breath will be laughter, and Hades will not be able to contain that laughter. It's the laughter of paradise. Today you'll be with me in paradise, says Jesus. You will laugh, and, and you, can, you can begin to laugh right now. A few months before my father died, he called me laughing with the little breath that he had, because he didn't have much by that time, but he was laughing. He said, Peter, Jared just called. Jared's my nephew. He was about four years old at the time. He said, Peter, Jared just called, and, and this is what he said to me. He said, Poppy, can I come over to your house for ice cream one more time before you die? And of course, my dad, without skipping a beat, he said, well, of course, Jared, come on over. See, my dad was not going to let fear spoil his ice cream or Jared's ice cream. And so people have been asking, Peter, over 200,000 people have died from COVID. People are dying from gunshots, race riots, fires. We might die. What does it all mean? think it all means we're going to die. Well, do you think Jesus is coming? I'm sure he's coming. He said he would come for each one of us. Well, what should we do? Fear not. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord. He will fight for you, and you have only to be still. Okay, so like practically, what does that mean? Wear a mask, practice physical distancing if you think that's appropriate, but, but do not let fear spoil the ice cream. Do not let fear keep you from walking in the way of love. Don't let fear keep you from following the pillar of fire and smoke, even if he leads you to the gates of hell, for the gates of hell will not prevail against the Lord and his church. And if, and if, and if you really want to change the world, just laugh. Laugh while drowning. People will see that. Laugh while drowning. And how do I do that? Well, on the night that our Lord was betrayed, on the night that the Word was betrayed, on the night that the Logos spoken into the chaos was betrayed, on the night that the angel of Yahweh was betrayed, on the night that the promised seed, the seed of Abraham, 
the incorruptible seed was betrayed. He took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat. Do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and said, this is the covenant in my blood. The life is in the blood. Drink of it, all of you. So how can you laugh while drowning? Because you know the resurrection and the life is inside of you. Amen. Yeah, so Father, we, uh, we thank you for showing us Yeshua, <laughs> your salvation, our Lord Jesus, and that we are sons and daughters. So Father, I pray that you would forgive us for our fear. I thank you that you not only forgive us for our fear, but you save us from our fear in which we drown. And so now, Lord God, I pray that you would remind us to laugh like Isaac, the son of Abraham, whose name means laughter. <laughs> I thank you, Lord God, that you sit in heavens and you laugh our silly ego to scorn. You laugh everything that would raise his proud head against you to scorn, not because you hate, but because you are love. And so, Father, we ask that you would rise through the power of your spirit, that, Jesus, you would rise within us as faith, hope, and love, and that you would be glorified in us, your people, your church. In Jesus' name, amen. So I, I don't know what this uh, message means exactly to you where you're at, but I think I know what it means to me and I think what it means to us. I don't get... My wife gets these cool prophetic words. They're awesome. I don't really get that very often. But I think Jesus is saying something like this. Because, you know, this, this whole COVID thing has been kind of scary. And, um, I mean, I'm not, I don't think I'm real scared about me. I'm scared about, well, God, what are you doing with the church? What, you know, uh, just when things are really starting to go, um, all this COVID thing happens and people can't come to church and, Everything's under stress. What are you saying to us? And I think this is what he's saying to us. Fear not. Stand firm. See the salvation of the Lord. I will fight for you, and you have only to be still. And so then I, I go, okay, well, God, uh, practically speaking, <laughs> what does that mean to me? Because I have to preach a sermon on Sunday, and I think this is what he's saying. Tell the people to go forward. Go forward. Don't let fear spoil the ice cream. And if you happen to drown, just make sure you're laughing when you go under. <laughs> and so uh, I think God is calling us to move forward into the future with a lot of hope and a lot of courage, and we'll be telling you more about that in the next few weeks. Um, that's us. But for you, may maybe you can just remember this. Don't let fear spoil the ice cream. And if you find yourself drowning, just remember to laugh. Because the life and the resurrection <laughs> lives inside of you. That's quite a ride. In Jesus' name, believe the gospel. Amen.